Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today we're going to follow up from the video that I recently produced with um, my mentoring professor from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Adam Harwood. Many of you may remember that have been tuning in regularly. We went over his systematic theology, um, the biblical, historical, and systematic, and uh, highly recommend the systematic if you're looking for one that is written by a uh, non-Calvinist, if you will, uh, scholar, but he includes, as he uh, told us, um, you know, teachings from a wide array of Christian history in order to educate versus indoctrinate. And uh, on page, let me pull it up, 589, there's a table there, table 23-1, that, um, that you can actually see more clearly because it's uh, put here on the screen for us, where it goes through the word predestined or perizo in the original language. Um, and so let me uh, add this to the screen so you can see this. And he, he lists all uh, six times that the word perizo, predestination, is used in the New Testament and gives a, a summary of what each of those are meaning. And I thought, well, that's a great episode for us to examine, do a word study, if you will, of all the, the New Testament uses of the word predestined and see if those words uh, correlate to what the Calvinists teach. Because as we know, uh, and we've talked about here many times, is Calvinists often take the word predestination uh, to mean ultimately that God has predetermined before the world begins who will and won't believe so as to be saved. And so it seems to me that if that is what predestination actually means, then there should be at least one verse that actually says that that gives us that indication contextually that God is predestined for certain people to be believers. Um, he is somehow effectually causing certain people to be believers. Everybody's born effectually unable to believe. In other words, they don't have any control over their inability to believe the gospel. They're born that way by divine decree on Calvinism, unless God intervenes in some supernatural way, causing them to believe. That is the essence of Calvinism. And they're using the term predestination to support this concept that God is ultimately predestined, whether you will go to heaven or hell before you're ever even created. Um, that is the crux of the Calvinistic system. And we are looking at, by doing a word study, the word predestination in the original languages and saying, okay, do any of these verses actually say that? And we're gonna look at each one of them in particular and be as fair as we possibly can be. Um, I know you may be watching this. Well, how can you possibly be fair? You're obviously the anti-Calvinist Leighton Flowers. Yes, well, I was a Calvinist for 10 years for a reason. It's because I read these texts with the premise of Calvinism in full view, with the interpretation of predestination like a Calvinist. And to be fair and to be objective, you've got to back away and you've got to ask yourself the question, what do these texts mean in their original context? What is this word, perizo, in the original language, uh, predestination, what does it actually mean? Uh, and, and how are we to understand it? And so that's why we're going to go through each one of these texts in order to do that. So let's start with Acts chapter 4, verse 28, and looking at the word predestination. Um, Adam Harwood's uh, conclusion is that ultimately this word is teaching that God has predestined the cross of Christ. Now, can we all agree with that? <laughs> Any Calvinist on the side chat? Anybody listening who's a Calvinist as well? Uh, I think we can all agree that God predestined, predetermined, if you will, decided beforehand that the cross of Christ would come to pass, that, that, that God would send his son uh, not only to become incarnate, but to ultimately die a death on the cross for the payment of the sins of the world. I think we can all agree that God has predestined the cross of Christ. But let's look at the verse in its original context because that's what we're doing here, a word study. So let's look at the word, beginning verse 27. For truly this city there were gathered together against you, holy, your holy servant, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples, peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so here's where the word peridzo is used in the original language, the word predestined, is it, does it have anything to do with God predestining people to be believers? No. So, so far, and I don't think Calvinists would claim that, by the way, but I'm just, remember, that's the standard that we're looking for for any of these verses. And I'm not saying that Calvinists are trying to say that this verse teaches 
predestination with regard to salvation. Um, what I'm saying is we're going to look at each one of these verses to see if any of them meet that standard. And I don't think that any of them do for obvious reasons we're going to look at. But I, I want to highlight this, this particular passage because it does show us something that sometimes Calvinists don't understand about provisionists. We do believe God predestines things. Okay, Just because we don't believe in determinism doesn't mean we don't believe that God determines things. Of course God's, God determines things. God has the ability of self-determination to make choices, to do things, to accomplish his will and his purposes. We don't believe that free will is a superpower that thwarts the will of God. And so God does what he pleases. Um, this is one of the reasons that I wrote the uh, article years ago, Does Calvary Prove Divine Determinism? Because some Calvinists, like John Piper, we've played him before, and others actually use Acts chapter 4 to, to demonstrate how God is good while predetermining evil. And this is sometimes the text that Calvinists will use to say ultimately, well, you know, look at what God did to predetermine the cross, the worst evil of all times in, in, in that, in that these, these people killed Jesus. And Jesus is perfect, and, and he's an innocent human being. What, what worse evil is there than to kill the son, of, the son of God? And yet God predetermined it. Thus, this proves that God can predetermine evil um, and, and still not be guilty for it. And therefore, that gives them the underlying philosophical basis and the, the moral basis by which to say God predetermines all evil. And, and we just push back on that for, for obvious reasons. And so let me go over that just real quickly by reading this article. John Piper and many other Calvinists appealed to God's work to ensure Calvary, as seen in Acts 4 that we just read, as a proof text for the divine de determinism, or at least to give uh, credence to divine determinism. In other words, to give the moral uh, underpinning for the divine determinism. If, I, I, if we can prove that God even determined one evil event, then that somehow gives us the, the ability to say that God can justly predetermine all evil events uh, without being held culpable for doing so. But does citing examples of events that God has worked to bring about prove God brings about all events in this manner? If so, there are some significant issues that need to be addressed. Here's a question for my Calvinistic friends. When we object to the concept of divine determinism, God's sovereign work to bring about all things whatsoever that come to pass, and you appeal to the crucifixion as your proof that God brings about all moral evil, are you saying that God is sovereignly working so as to redeem the very sins that he sovereignly worked to bring about? Let me ask that question again. Are you trying to argue, ultimately, that God is working to redeem the sins that he sovereignly brought to pass by his sovereign decree? Is Calvary just about God cleaning up his own mess, so to speak, redeeming his own determinations? So he determines the sins of the murderers, but he brings about the means by which those very sins were committed that he himself determined? Appealing to God's sovereign work to ensure the redemption of sin, I write, so as to prove that God sovereignly works to bring about all the sin that was redeemed is a self-defeating argument. It would be tantamount to arguing that because a police department set up a sting operation to catch a notorious drug dealer, that the police department is responsible for every single intention and action of all drug dealers at all times. Proof that the police department worked in secretive ways to hide their identities, use evil intentions, and work out the circumstances in such a way that the drug dealer would do what they wanted him to do, sell drugs, at a particular moment in time, does not suggest that the police are in any way responsible for all that drug dealer has done or ever will do. We celebrate and reward the actions of this police department because they are working to stop the drug activity, not because they are secretly causing all of it so as to stop some of it. Teaching that God brings about all sin based upon how he brought about Calvary is like teaching that the police officer brings about every drug deal based upon how he brought about one sting operation. Yes, at times the scriptures do speak of God hardening men's hearts, ex uh, examples like Exodus 7 or Romans 9, blinding them with a spirit of stupors we see in Romans 11, 8, delaying their healing by use of parabolic uh, language like we see in Mark 4 or Matthew 13 or Matthew 16. And he always does so for a redemptive good. But the reason such passages stand out so distinctly from the rest of Scripture is because of their uniqueness. If God worked this way in every instance, these texts would make no sense. After all, what is there for God to harden, provoke, or restrain, if not the autonomous will of creatures? In other words, if God is sovereignly decreeing every choice and every desire that everybody makes, then what is the purpose in stepping in, intervening to harden a heart? or to restrain evil. What are you restraining? Your own decree? I decreed them to do evil, and then I restrained them from doing the evil? 
that doesn't make any sense. The, the intervention of God proves free will. It, it demonstrates free will. It doesn't disprove it, as sometimes Calvinists seem to think. If everything is under the meticulous control of God's sovereign work, what is left to permit and or restrain except that which he's already controlling? Is God merely restraining something that he previously determined? Why blind eyes from seeing something that were naturally predetermined not to see? Why put a parabolic blindfold on a corpse-like dead sinner incapable of seeing spiritual truth? These are questions that many, not all, but many Calvinists seem unwilling to entertain at any depth. And that's why we're pushing back on this. So going back to Acts chapter 4, we do believe God predestined some things. We don't believe that he had to predestine the cross by making Pontius Pilate evil, by decreeing that Herod would be an evil man from birth and couldn't do otherwise. No, we believe that he knows Herod's heart. He knows the heart of Judas. He knows the heart of Pilate. He knows the hearts of the Gentile peoples of that day. He knows the hearts of the Romans at that day. He uses them in their already rebellious condition. He blinds them from the truth so as to bring about his purpose and his plan through their evil intentions. So God, you don't need omnideterminism to bring about the predestination of Calvary. Uh, you don't, in other words, it doesn't prove anything uh, to, to suggest that God predetermined one event that has evil involved. And just because God determines a, an event that is evil doesn't mean that he ultimately causes the evil intentions of the actors involved. Let me, let me say that again. Just because God predetermines an evil event that takes place does not mean that God caused the pride and the lust of those involved in that event. The selling of Joseph into slavery by the brothers is often an example of this. God does not have to cause, predetermine the pride and the lust of the brothers in order to ensure that that event takes place. He can simply know it and use the circumstances for his own benefit, which is exactly what our theodicy would say, that God uses the free will creature's choices, knowing what they are in the given circumstances to bring about his purpose and his plan. You don't need omnideterminism to get to that point. That's why we're pushing back. So let's go now to the next verse we see in Romans 8, 29, and 30. So it's used twice right next to each other in verses 29 and 30. Again, the word predestination. And here's Adam Harwood's conclusion based upon what the text actually says, and we're going to look at it. Believers are predestined to be like Jesus. That's what verse 29 says, that believers are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's all that verse 29 says. Verse 30 goes on to say that believers are predestined, who are predestined to be like Jesus, they are called, they're justified, and they're glorified. So those who believers who are predestined to become like Jesus, they're also predestined to be called, justified, and glorified, because that's what he does for believers. This is how God brings about his purpose and his plan. Um, and so let's look at those passages. By the way, there is an article also on Romans 8 and my interpretation of Romans 8, 29 and following there at Sociology 101 if you want to look at that. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to, to go there and to, to look at it in its entirety. It's also in my book, um, the, the Potter's Promise. If you're interested in looking at a more detailed uh, outline or uh, investigation of Romans 8, um, but right now I'm just giving an overview uh, using uh, just a, f a focus on the word predestined. And so for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Pre he, so he predestined people to be believers. Does it say that? No. What does it say? He predestined them to be conformed into the image of his son. That's sanctification. So who is he predestining to what? Well, look back up in verse um, 28. We know that for those who love God, so he's talking about who? Believers, those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So for those who love God is who he's talking about. So those who are predestined to be conformed in the image of his son are who? Believers are predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. That's all verse 29 is ultimately saying. And verse 30 is just uh, expanding upon that, that those who are that are predestined to be conformed into his, the likeness of his son, these are the persons who are called justified and are glorified ultimately. And again, we go into more detail in that article if you want to go look at how we lay that out. But notice that the word predestination here never talks about people before they're ever born being predestined to be believers. It only talks about those who love God being predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. And so again, it's the burden of the Calvinists to prove their definition of the term. And so far, none, not one of the three texts we've looked at say anything about people 
before the foundation of the world being predestined to become believers. That's just not in, in the text, okay? So what is the next scripture verse? 1 Corinthians 2, 7, the word peridzo is also used. And here, according to Dr. Adam Harwood, it is talking about God predestining to include Gentiles among God's people. So let's look at that text together, 1 Corinthians. Here it is, verse 7. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages. This is the same word, perizo, and so it could say God predestined before the ages for our glory. But um, for whatever reason, the translators of this particular version uh, the ESV here used decreed before the ages for our glory. Okay, so what is what is predestined here? Well, he's talking about the secret and hidden wisdom, hidden wisdom of God, and, and none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Which, by the way, this is a verse that we often appeal to to talk about why God would hide the truth for a time until He accomplished the crucifixion. These things were hidden from their eyes. These things were being blinded from them so as to bring about the crucifixion. Because if they had realized that Jesus was truly their Messiah, they never would have crucified him. And that wouldn't have brought about God, God's predetermined plan. So God, by means of using parabolic language and hiding the truth from uh, the, the people of that day in parables and those kinds of things, he kept them in the dark so as to bring about the crucifixion through their already rebellious actions, much like a in a sting operation, the cops would hide their identity because had they known they were cops, they would never have sold drugs in front of them, right? So they hide their identity to accomplish an evil event for a good purpose. But they themselves are not causing the criminals to be criminals. They themselves are not uh, causing them to be evil, which is where predestination from the Calvinistic perspective, I think, think falls short because under determinism, God would be not only to be determining the criminals to sell drugs at that particular time, but ultimately under determinism, uh, they would be being determined to be criminals in the first place. And every criminal activity would be ultimately determined by the maker uh, or by the cops in that analogy. And so that, I think that's where it falls short. And so what's being predetermined here? That, that God will save the Gentiles, that this is the hidden mystery that has just now been uh, revealed for the ages. And this is a cross-reference, by the way, to Ephesians chapter 3, where it says, beginning in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery, so again, he's talking about this mystery, was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you will, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So how will they perceive the, the, the insight to the mystery of Christ? by reading what the inspired author says, okay? And so that's the means by which we, the church, can perceive insight or get this insight is by reading from the Holy Spirit-inspired author, who is the Apostle Paul in this instance. Verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. In other words, this is, wasn't revealed to everyone else, but it has been now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so the Spirit is revealing this truth to chosen apostles, so that they can write it down so that we can, as a church, understand it. That's what he's talking about. This mystery is what? That the Gentiles are fellow heirs by grace through faith, regardless of your the, the keeping of the law, regardless of your nationality and all those kinds of things. They are by grace through faith, fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring the light for everyone. Who is it for? The light for everyone. What is the plan and the mystery? Um, it comes up there. For the hidden ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be now made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose which he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is a purpose from the beginning. God from the very beginning has predestined, has determined beforehand that Gentiles will be included in the covenant by grace through faith by means of the gospel. So this is, this is something God chose before the foundation of the world, but it's a secret, a mystery that was not revealed to generations before, but that is now being made known through the apostles and the prophets. That's the mystery that is being revealed. Now, that's important when you go on to talk about the next verse in our list here. If we go back to the list, again, we're doing a word study for the word predestination throughout all of the New Testament. 
and you come to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. That's the next section where you see the word predestination. I think it's interesting, by the way, that the word, uh, the word um, persuasion is used two to three times more often than the word predestination, and yet gets a, a fraction of the, the coverage, especially in Reformed circles. Uh, uh, there's a lot of focus on the word predestination, but the word persuasion is actually a very biblical word, talking about persuading, trying to, trying to convince others using the Word of God of the truthfulness of Scripture. Um, and if predestination, according to the way Calvinists interpret it, is true, then I, I see no real place for persuasion. Um, why try to persuade somebody all day long? Like Acts chapter 28 says Paul does. If you believe in predestination according to the way the Calvinists teach it, because ultimately if you've been predestined to believe the truth, then you don't really need to be persuaded of it. You'll get the you know, the election and the regeneration will take care of that. You don't need to persuade somebody. God will open their eyes and help them see, and you don't really need to do that. Uh, Jamie Russell, thank you for your super chat. I appreciate that. So let's look at Ephesians 1. Uh, we'll look at both verse 5 and uh, verse 11. But let's start kind of back at the beginning here and, and look at what it says. It says, uh, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now this in Christ Jesus right here, this is a term that he uses over and over and over again. It's very Pauline to say in him or in Christ. Well, who are the faithful in Christ? Believers, okay? That's the us in him. From now on, when you see us in him, he's talking about the those who have faith in Christ, whether Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, or free. Uh, if you're talking about the faithful in Christ Jesus, uh, that's the us and him. Okay, so you can't you can't uh, forget that because that's the audience. That's who he's talking to, and that's what he's talking about. So keep let's keep that right there in mind. Who is he talking to? The faithful in Christ Jesus, people who have faith in him. That's who he's talking to. Grace and peace to you from our, our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessings be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. So who is he blessing in Christ? The faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who he's blessing, according to this, with every spiritual blessing. So who is he giving every spiritual blessing to? The faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who he's giving every spiritual blessing to. So he's not giving, you're not getting spiritual blessings until you're in Christ. You can't have these spiritual blessings that he's about to list until you're in Christ. If you have the, the, the blessings in Christ before you're ever born, or before the foundation of the world, then none of this makes any, any rational sense whatsoever. Your blessings come in Christ, not before the foundation of the world. Okay, So, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So, who's chosen to be holy, that we should be holy and blameless before him? Who is chosen for what? You can't just assume that people are chosen arbitrarily before they're ever born to become believers because this verse never says anything about anybody being chosen before the foundation of the world to become believers. What's Who's being chosen for what? The faithful in him, the those chosen in him, those in him through faith are chosen to be holy and blameless. And when was this choice made? Before the foundation of the world. Same thing as what Ephesians 1 was saying. This is chosen, this mystery that's just being revealed from before the foundation of the world. It's always been God's choice that those who are in him through faith will be made holy and blameless, whether Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. This, from the foundation of the world, has been God's plan. That whoever is in him through faith will be made holy and blameless. Now, is being holy and blameless the same as being a believer? No. No. So it's not, it's, it, it's, it's believers are predestined to become like Christ, just like verse 29 of Romans chapter 8 says. Believers are predestined to become like Christ. Believers are predestined to what? Become holy and blameless. That's like Jesus. That's the same exact thing. And so these, these, the, this verse is not saying that certain individuals are arbitrarily chosen to become by some effectual means into believers. It's saying that God has chosen those who are in Christ through faith to become holy and blameless. And this is his plan from the very beginning. This has always been his plan. That's what Paul is talking about. I think a good illustration of this is the one that I talked about before is, is like the uh, um, great fortress. There's this huge fortress that God has created and he's put right in the middle of the, 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 this, uh, this land. And there's a great storm coming. And he says to his people, 
if you get into the fortress, you will live. You'll survive. It's predestined. I have predestined that anyone who's in that fortress will survive. If you stay outside of the fortress, you will not survive. You will surely die. Okay? I've predestined it, in fact. And so it's ultimately your choice as to whether you get into the fortress or not. But it has been predestined beforehand what will happen to you if you're outside the fortress, and it's predestined what will happen to you if you're inside the fortress. You see the difference? And so the storm comes. Everyone outside the fortress per perishes. Everyone inside the, the, the fortress survives, okay? Just like he predestined. So you could rightly say, well, well, those people who died outside the fortress, were they predestined to die? You could say, yes, they were predestined to die doesn't mean that they could not have gotten into the fortress. It just simply means that God had destined beforehand what will happen to those outside the fortress. Just like he destined beforehand the spiritual blessings, the good things that would happen for those who are in the fortress. That's what predestination is always talking about. It's always talking about what God has destined beforehand for those who are in Christ. But you're responsible as to whether you put your faith in Christ or not. It's really not that hard. It doesn't have to be this esoteric, weird baggage of God looking through quarters of time and, and this, this weird thing of all this, this, this monergism, synergism, and, and double predestination, and this concept of infralapsary and a superlapsary, and all these things that we've just spilled so much ink and time trying to uncover this weird mystery of God's predestination. It's really, really simple. If you're in the fortress, God is destined beforehand, you will be saved. If you remain outside his fortress, you will surely die. And it's really that simple. You're responsible for what you do. It, it's not hard. It, a, a fisherman can understand it, like Peter. Somebody without a, a philosophy degree can get this. You don't need Molinism to explain this. Sorry, Molinist, you can be a Molinist if you want, but you don't need Molinism to explain this verse. It's really not that hard. It's really quite simple when you understand it in its context. It goes on, it says, in love, he predestined us for adoption. Oh, there it is. Predestined for adoption. There, there, there's the proof for Calvinism because he's predestined certain individuals to be adopted, which means he predestined certain individuals to be saved. Is that what it says? What is, what is adoption? Adoption is a future hope. How do I know this? Because that's what Paul says in Romans 8.23. He says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. What is he waiting? We wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what is adoption in the mind of Paul? Adoption is the redemption of our bodies. So it's one thing to sign the documents for adoption. The doc, you know, If you're an adopted child, you go sign the documents and they're legally your children. But adoption is not really complete until you, you take them home with you. They take up residence in your home. Well, God has gone to prepare a place for us. And I eagerly, like Paul saying, I eagerly await for my adoption. Which, how do I know it's going to happen? Because God has predestined it for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has destined beforehand that those who are in Christ will be adopted. I'm looking forward to the future hope of my adoption because it's not yet completed until, what, the redemption of of our bodies. And so the concept of being predestined to adoption does not support the Calvinistic premise when we understand adoption as a future hope instead of a past and completed reality. As if I was predestined to be adopted before I was ever born, and therefore I was predestined, determined by God to be a believer, to get into the fortress, when the Bible never clearly states that. In fact, if you go back to the, the text, how do you get to be in Christ? Because that's a pretty important point, is how to get to be in Christ. Well, just scroll on down to verse 13. Um, in him you also, when you heard, speaking of the Gentile people, in other words, the us he's referring to, the faithful in Christ Jesus, the, the followers, the Jewish followers, also you Gentiles, when you believed, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So when are you sealed in him? You are sealed in him when you believe and not beforehand. And so you don't get the spiritual blessings until you believe. It's through belief. It's through faith that you are sealed in Christ, that you are sealed in him, not beforehand. Um, verse 11 is the other time that it's used. I want to make sure to, to go, not, not miss that as well. Uh, so he predestined us for adoption. We already went over that in verse 5. And then he goes on to talk about in him we have redemption through his blood, verse 7, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth 
in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined. So who is being predestined here? Again, he's talking to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So the faithful in Christ have obtained an inheritance. The faithful in Christ have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the counsel of his will. Now this is present active. So he's working all things according to the counsel of his will is presently actively working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In other words, uh, Ephesians 1.11 is a parallel to Romans 8.28, that God works all things, he's actively presently working all things together for good for whom? For those who love God, for those who are believers, for the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's all this verse is saying. This verse says nothing about God predestining certain individuals before they're ever born to become believers. It's all about God predestining those who are in Christ Jesus to, to have the spiritual blessings to fulfill the purpose of him who is actively presently working out all things in accordance with his purpose and his will. In other words, working something out that's bad for good doesn't mean you have to determine the bad in order to work it for good. God doesn't have to be the determiner of the bad in order to work it for good. Okay? And that's what Calvinists have ultimately done using a more deterministic philosophy here because they ultimately have God causing the bad in order to work it for good. And what we're saying, no, no, the bad comes from the world. It comes from Satan. It comes from humanity. It comes from us. It's from the world. First John 2, 16, pride and lust are not from the Father, but from the world. God takes that pride and that lust and those evil deeds, and he can work and redeem and bring good even from evil. So even from the evil of the Gentiles and Pontius Pilate and Judas and Herod, he can take those evil intentions and actions of man, even the evil intentions of Joseph's brothers, he can take those evil intentions, knowing what they are, and he can work them out, presently actively working them out, bringing about his good purpose, despite and sometimes through those free moral evil actions. God does not have to be implicated as the author and the approver of transgression under provisionism. And that's why it's a better interpretation than the ones the Calvinists are providing. Notice not a single one of the verses we've just listed says anything about individuals before the foundation of the world being chosen or caused or determined or predetermined to become believers. Every single time the word is used, it's used in a different context, whether it's God predestined in the cross of Christ, believers being predestined to be like Jesus, Believers predestined to be like Jesus, being called, justified, and glorified. Uh, God predestined to include Gentiles among God's people. Uh, believers predestined for adoption, which is a future event, according to Paul. Ephesians 1.11, believers being predestined to obtain an inheritance. In other words, that's one of the spiritual blessings that God has determined will happen to those who are in Christ. Every single one of these has nothing to do with the Calvinistic premise of God predetermining certain people to be become Christians and the rest to be born hopeless without any opportunity to become a real Christian, not a single one. And that's, that's something you've got to look at. You've got to look at the implication of a system because think about the implications of what Calvinism's interpretation of predestination ultimately are saying. You're born by God's predetermined will to be incapable of believing the Bible. Okay. You can believe the Quran. You can believe any other truth of a history book in the world. You can believe other world religions, but the one thing you're born by God's decree, mind you, you're unable to believe and to trust in the Bible. You can trust in Confucius. You can trust in Muhammad. You can trust in atheism. You can trust in science. You can trust in any of those other things. But the one thing God predetermined from the world before the foundation of the world is that all sinners would be born unable to believe his truth. And yet he's going to hold you accountable for that for eternity in a place called hell. And you're born that way unless he picked you unilaterally for no apparent reason. In other words, no known reason known to us. He, it's within the hidden counsel of his will for his own self-glorification. He just seemingly arbitrarily picks certain individuals and changes their very human nature to be a nature that wants to accept him and wants to believe in him. And those are the ones who are the elect, the, the, the predestined ones, those who are predestined. Think about the implications of that. Think about what that means. That means that the people who end up in hell were not loved by their maker. They were actually, salvifically, at least speaking, they were hated by their maker. They were created for not fellowship, not, not love, not opportunity to have real relationship. Or uh, they, they were created ultimately for destruction. 
They were created ultimately, as Calvin says, doomed from the womb and only created ultimately to display God's wrath through their perdition and through their um, their damnation. Is that is that Bible or is that just Calvinism? That this is where you've got to, you don't only have to look at the, the interpretational differences. You have to look at the implications of those interpretive differences. Where, where, where does this lead you? This leads to you ultimately to ultimately have to believe that the reprobates, the non-elect people, are victims. Look up the word victim in the Bible, or excuse me, in, in any dictionary, and what does it say? <laughs> people are being acted upon beyond their control. It's, it's something they have no control over. That's exactly what the T of Tulip teaches. You're born beyond your control in this condition from birth where you hate God and you hate the gospel and you will always deny it unless he picked you before you were ever created and causes you to believe in him. And this is supposed to be just. This is supposed to be right. What you've just done is you've removed the blameworthiness of the sinner who has rejected a God who ultimately is not rejecting a God who loves and provides for him, but he's rejecting a God who doesn't love and doesn't provide for them and has actually created him for destruction. No wonder they hate this God. Wouldn't you, if you were created for that end, if God created you for destruction, wouldn't you hate that? Just be honest. You Either you would or you wouldn't. Is that what Romans 9 is really talking about in context? I suggest it isn't. It's one of the reasons I wrote this book. It's one of the reasons that many Arminians and provisionists have written books uh, countering the Calvinistic interpretation, which is contrary to many interpretations throughout Christian history, especially for the first 400 years of the Christian church. We don't see the Calvinistic interpretation until uh, Augustine in the 5th century. And it introduces a more fatalistic, a more deterministic way of understanding the text. And I'm just pushing people to just step back, do your own word study. By, by, the, by, by the way, um, please don't just take my word for it anytime. I don't, I don't want you to follow what I'm saying and just say, oh, okay, because Leighton said it, I don't have to think. I don't have to do my own study. No, uh, it's Perizzo, Strong's G4309. In other words, the Strong's number is G4309. Go look it up yourself and do your own word study. Matter of fact, I'll even show you uh, Strong's G there so you can screen grab it if you want to. There it is right there. Go do a, a word study of Perizzo for yourself and go to, through every one of those texts, just like I did, read them in context and ask yourself the question, is the word predestination ever used in the context of individuals being chosen to become believers by some effectual work of grace or not. I just showed you every single one of them and demonstrated for you that not a single one meets that criteria. And therefore, you don't have all the negative impl implications of the Calvinistic worldview of God ultimately predetermining people uh, to be destined for hell before they're ever born without any choice in the matter and without any control over it. Um, and all the, the implications and the problems that that, that issue creates. The reason this has been one of the most debated and controversial doctrines within Christian history is because of that difficult pill of double predestination, of reprobation, of God ultimately creating people for the purpose of destroying them, for the purpose of bringing judgment upon them, when in reality they have absolutely no control over the fact of how they're born and how they will remain. Um, and God's ultimately determining that. That's one of the reasons we're putting these videos out, is for people to see there are better, I obviously I think they're better, more robust interpretive uh, explanations of the texts that are in question than what the Calvinist has to offer. And our interpretation doesn't come with all the baggage and the implications that the Calvinistic uh, worldview uh, entails. And that's why we're doing this. Well, that's why we're pushing back on these things. Now. I'm looking now at the side chat, seeing that many of you are having conversations that have absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, as you were predestined, I suppose, um, depending on where you stand on that. But I did want to try to answer some questions during the last portion of this. It's been a while since I took questions. And so I know last time I told you I was going to take some questions and then we ended up going so long uh, that I didn't have time to, to look at the side chat. So if you've got a question and you would like to post their question uh, very boldly and let me so I can see it. Um, we would appreciate that. Um, and so I, I see, by the way, shout out to Nathan Hellrung. Um, Nathan, I appreciate you. Uh, there's so many times, Nathan, where I have gotten just stopped to scroll through some of the comments underneath a particular video because 
just time wise, there's no way I could I could respond to comments. And nine times out of ten, Nathan Hellrung has got there before I have, and has said something better than I probably would have said it, at least much more brief <laughs> brief way than I would have said it. So Nathan, well done. Uh, thank you for helping to answer a lot of the questions from a provisionist perspective, so to speak. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, I've rarely, if ever, seen Nathan say something that I wouldn't wouldn't agree with. So usually, if uh, if you're looking for a good answer from a provisionist uh, that is willing to engage with you on the side chat, um, Nathan might be yeah Nathan. Thanks Nathan. Nathan might be a good one for you to to look at if you want to look at a, an answer to the question. Um, uh, Isaac is asking a question. Leighton, why does Calvin's commentary contradict so many modern Calvinist interpretations? That's a great question, um, and it and it is true. Uh, there, there are a lot of interpretations that I'll, I'll go to. I'll, I'll pull up Romans. Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, there's several of them. The one that I did debate recently, when um, John chapter six, where it talks about the work of God is this, uh, and 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 some Calvinists like Gabe that I was debating takes that as it's an effectual work of God. I actually use Calvin's commentary to contradict him because Calvin is the is has the correct interpretation of that passage. And so I use Calvin to do that because they may not listen to, you know, provisionist latent flowers, but certainly they'll listen to the namesake of their own system, at least entertain what Calvin has to say. Same with, um, uh, what is it, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that, that, uh, about the gift. Um, this gift is not of yourself. Um, Calvin actually says the gift is not referring to faith, but uh, to all the proceedings, salvation as, as a whole. And so um, he gets it right, in other words. And so when Calvin's right, he's right. And I often try to quote from Calvin when he's right because Calvinists will more likely listen to Calvin than they will to me. And there's many times where Calvin's commentary is actually correct in its interpretation. Uh, other times, obviously, that he's not. But when he's right, he's right. And he should be given uh, props when he is. And so I don't mind quoting from him when he's right. Just like I've, I've quoted from Piper when he's right or I've quoted from MacArthur when he's right. Uh, I use MacArthur a lot to counter Calvinist interpretation. Uh, John MacArthur wrote a, a book on the love of God, uh, pushing back against uh, A.W. Pink's, a higher version of Calvinism that says God doesn't love everyone. And John MacArthur writes a book countering that higher Calvinistic perspective. So I quote from MacArthur when it serves my purpose to show my Calvinist friends that may be becoming more hyper in their tendencies uh, to recognize that even other Calvinists contend with them. I, I quote a lot from Bruce Ware, who is more of a four-point Calvinist when dealing with limited atonement, because Bruce Ware is a well-known, well-respected Calvinist uh, there at Southern as a teacher, but does a really good job showing Calvinist why limited atonement is not biblical. And a lot of his views and a lot of his perspectives are very similar to that of David Allen's or mine. Uh, with regard to why limited atonement is not a biblical perspective, so it's it's good to to be able to uh, uh, to do that. Okay. Um, okay. Aaron is asking a question. Um, by the way, Aaron, um, I, I just have to say you you have been you have been asking questions and contending with me years now. I'm sure. And I don't recall even one time, Aaron, where you have allowed a lot of flesh to come out in your questions. You have always asked your questions respectfully. You obviously disagree with me, um, but I just want to give you a shout out because thank you for that. Even on, I, I realized recently that you're um, you're one of the, uh, uh, the 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 guys I, I contend with on Twitter. Sometimes I didn't realize you're, you were Aaron because of I think the way it was labeled. But I think it was you. That's actually the, the same one that I've been contending with on uh, uh, on Twitter. And I noticed that uh, even on Twitter, you're always very respectful. And so I like Calvinists who are respectful and push back on me about different things, by the way. Just just a shout out. So he's asking about Ephesians 1.14. So let's bring that up. Okay. For this reason, wait, is that right? No, that's Ephesians 3. Sorry. Ephesians 1.13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Um, so when were the predestined considered to be God's possession before or after creation? Well, if you mean by God's possession in him or his, then when they heard the message, they were marked 
in him. So you become in him when you hear the message and you believe. So by grace through faith is when you are his possession, according to verse 14. Verse 14 says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory? So again, maybe I'm missing what your question is, but I'm not seeing why that would be contradicting to what we said. Um, thank you, Nathaniel, for your, your super chat. Uh, he asked, have you ever written uh, on or had guest on to discuss the sociology of Eastern Orthodoxy? There are some interesting similarities to provisionism include an ancestral sin versus original sin. Um, if you've got some good recommendations of uh, those from Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, maybe the Bible Answer Man, I guess he's recently converted to Orth Eastern Orthodoxy from what I've heard. I'm sure that I have some issues with Eastern Orthodoxy. I don't consider myself to be a scholar on Eastern or Orthodox religion or their particular views on anything. But I have heard that in Eastern Orthodoxy, there is not this debate or this controversy because they don't consider Augustine as much of an authority as Western Christianity has over the years. And therefore, this has not really been a debate. They, they don't interpret predestination the way the Calvinists have. They don't take that more Westernized perspective of the me, I, my, individualized being, you know, individually chosen before the foundation of the world. They, they, they think in more corporate perspectives uh, naturally just because of their upbringing. Uh, and therefore, this controversy doesn't even really exist in Eastern or Eastern Orthodoxy, I do, I'm well aware of that. But if you have somebody in mind or a scholar who in the Eastern Orthodox, you know, uh, religion um, who would like to have a discussion on soteriology that you want to send to me, you know, I, I'd like to look at it. Um, again, I'm just scrolling through here to find the questions if I can here. Okay, Sean's asking, uh, what would you say to someone like that was on my hall that believed when they are not part of the elect from the Calvinistic worldview? That believed they are not part of the elect from the Calvinist. Okay, so it sounds like what you're you're asking is about like like the video we've played of um, Derek Webb uh, with Caitlin's call, who's who believed Calvinistically, he's now become an atheist, but he, he believes Calvinism is true. In other words, he believes the Bible's teaching Calvinism, but that he doesn't believe he's one of the elect. I assume that you're asking that. What would you say to someone like that? Um, well, obviously I would teach them that that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that you're arbitrarily elect before you're ever born. Uh, you're either picked or you're not. I would say, no, God loves you. He, you have an opportunity to be saved. Anyone can be saved. Uh, if you believe and trust in him, he will save you. There's nobody that's barred uh, from salvation, from birth, like Calvinists teach. In other words, I would show them why Calvinism is wrong so that they don't, you know, fall back into that that excuse. Well, I must not be chosen. I must not be elect uh, because that's, I don't think that's a healthy uh, perspective, obviously. Um Melissa is saying, maybe for a future episode, but I'd love to hear you talk about what glorifies God according to Scripture. Does God glorify himself by the Calvinistic reprobation of sinners? Yeah, and this is something I've talked about in other episodes, um, Melissa, but we don't, we don't bring God more or less glory. In other words, he's maximally glorious. I mean, he's, he, is, he, he doesn't need us to glorify him. Um, but the Bible calls us to glorify him, and what does that mean? Making him known. I mean, it, it, it's exalting, it's, it's praising and exalting him for who he is. So what it means to bring God glory, ultimately what, it, what that means is to make him known, um, to make his goodness known, to make who he is known. So if you're making him known for who he really is, then you're glorifying him. If you're making him known for something he's not, that's not of him, that's not true, then you're stealing glory in, in that sense. You're, 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 you're telling a falsehood about God. Uh, so like on Twitter, when you've got that guy on there saying Jesus was a bigot, you know, because they read a verse out of context about how he treated a woman uh, in a particular context, and he calls God, Jesus a bigot. Well, what is he doing? He's not glorifying God because he's not making Jesus known for who he really is because of a misinterpretation of a text. In the same way, I, I would say that Calvinists are not glorifying God because they're not ultimately making his character and his choices known for what they really are. They're, they're misinterpreting those texts. Now, they're doing so uh, 
mistakenly. In other words, I don't think that they're intentionally trying to misrepresent God. I wasn't when I was a Calvinist. They're trying to represent God for who he really is, but they've just misinterpreted some text. And in doing so, they are they are making known something about God that's not true, i.e. that God predestines some people for heaven and some people for hell and ultimately makes those decisions before they're ever born, and they ultimately have no control over the fact. Um, and, and that's what, why we're pushing back on that, because it isn't, we don't believe that brings glory to God, because it's misrepresenting his character uh, as, as one who truly does love those who end up in hell. The reason they perish is because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved, according to Paul. Not because God refused them, or because God didn't really love them, or God didn't really provide atonement for them, or something of that nature. Um, Yeah, yeah, Kenneth is asking the question, Leighton, please explain how the term death as in dead in our trespasses doesn't equate to total depravity. Um, I, I think it does equate to total depravity, but not in the way the Calvinist interprets depravity to mean inability. In other words, I can affirm depravity. We are sinful, we're under uh, corruption, we're separated uh, from God's fellowship outside the garden. That's what depravity means. Um, just like the prodigal son was separate uh, due to rebellion, from the father he was lost but now he's found he was dead but now he's alive so the idiomatic use of the word dead does not mean corpse-like inability to respond it means you're separated due to rebellion so what do you need to do to remedy that situation draw near to him repent come home um, and so the church in sardis was said to be dead wake up and renew what remains what is, what is he saying draw near to god come back to god stop rebelling it doesn't mean you can't do that and what's what calvinists have ultimately interpreted the word dead to mean is that you can't do it. If you're dead, you can't do otherwise. You, you, you can only do that. And that's not what dead's ever. I mean, even, even Romans 6 says that we as Christians are to be dead to sin. I wish that meant I could not sin anymore, but dead doesn't mean you can't do it. I can still sin. Dead to sin means I'm to separate myself from sin like I was once separated by sin from God. And so this idiomatic use of deadness in the original language is over-literalized by many Calvinists to mean that you have no ultimate responsibility, no ability to respond to God and his life-giving truth, which is just never established in the pages of Scripture. There's several articles and videos if you were to type in deadness at Sociology 101 or uh, at the YouTube page, uh, you, you would find a ton of videos on that, on that particular point. Um, all right, scrolling through here. So we ask when, uh, I, sometimes I have to read through these to make sure that they're uh, we're, uh, you know, uh, okay to put on the screen before I put them on there. Um, yeah, um, Craig is making a point and says, wouldn't you also say that we should ask when the destiny was decided, not just what was decided? For example, don't assume that from the foundation of the world in all cases. Right, yeah, there's a lot of times where people will take Ephesians 1, you know, verse out of Ephesians 1 for the foundation of the world and, and kind of plug it into Romans 9 somewhere or plug it into some other where, place where the word is used. And and again, from the foundation of the world, when Paul uses it, he's usually in reference to what we looked at in Ephesians 3, is that this is from the beginning. This is what he says to the church in Thessalonica. Um, he's chosen you from the beginning. This has always been his plan. And he's speaking to a predominantly Gentile church. Remember, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he's he's saying to this group of people who are known as the people who are not of God. These are the, the people who are not his possession. These are not Jews. And so they're, they're all being told, you know, you're not elect. And, and Paul's coming in and going, God has chosen you from the beginning. Uh, and we, we celebrate that God has chosen you from the beginning. And how do we know this? Because the Spirit came upon you just like he came, he came upon me, the Jewish apostle. And if the, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then we know he's chosen you from the very beginning. This has always been his plan. This has been his purpose. And so, yeah, you, you've got to understand the context in which Paul is speaking and not just assume the Western eyes, oh, that means he chose you, 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 but not you, you, you over there. You people are reprobates, but these people over here, because they're believers, they're, they must have been elected before the foundation of the world to become believers. And that's just not a biblical perspective as far as we can tell. Um Yeah, the interesting, Jack, you asked this question. I was just having a conversation with my son who asked basically the same question. Um, and he's asking, you, what do you say about uh, a God's provision being different for someone raised in a Christian home versus one raised in North Korea or Saudi Arabia? And that's what my son was asking in a conversation on the phone just, just before I started this broadcast. And he was saying, you know, I, I feel like I'm so privileged because I was raised in a Christian home by a Christian pastor and a Christian mom and dad 
taught me the Bible or something. But what about, and he's, you know, he's at the academy. And so he's, he's running into all these people who are raised in, you know, uh, Muslim countries and far off lands uh, that didn't have the kind of exposure that he had. And he said, that didn't seem fair. Uh, and he's asking that question. And I actually referred to him as I will to you as well, Jack. Um, there's a, a, an article called What About Those Who've Never Heard, as well as videos uh, on that topic where I go into uh, the details of that. And I, and I quote from some scholars that, uh, that pull up some verses about how God will hold us accountable for the light and revelation that we've been given. And, and there's several verses that support this concept that, that everyone re- receives sufficient light and that w- if you're, you're held accountable to the light that you've been given, and that God will bring more light, more revelation to those who are faithful with a little, and there's more details there at those articles if you want to look into those. In other words, we believe God's just, and he's right, and he's good, and the scripture seems to support that perspective. Um, Christian James saying, for visionism is fairly new, uh, I'm in alignment. So how do we correct brothers in love who have been indoctrinated since they grew up? Well, one, I wouldn't say provisionism is fairly new. The terminology may be new, but the things that we're promoting are basically a lot of the same things that the first first 300, 400 years of the Christian church taught, uh, at least as regard in regard to sociology uh, and those issues. And so um, the, the term provisionism is, is relatively new, but there's always new terms being thrown out every 100 years or so, new terms. I mean, the, the term tulip itself is 20th century uh, promoted by uh, Lorraine Bettner, from my understanding, uh, a popular Reformed Calvinist. He's the one who actually uh, made tulip, the, the acrostic tulip, popular. Well, again, you could say, well, that, even Calvinism, the term Calvinism is only you know less than 500 years old. Uh, in, in Christian history, that's, that's relatively new. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't use new words, so new terminology. So how do, how do you correct people who've been indoctrinated? Well, the, what we're doing here, you know, show them love, show them respect, make sure they feel like they're, they've been heard and their perspective has been heard, but then ask them to step out of their echo chamber, ask them will be willing to entertain some other ideas and to consider what you're saying and, and show them the scriptures for themselves and say, let's go back to the scripture. Let's, let's drop, you know, your typical interpretation, what you, whatever interpretation you've had in the past, and let's consider this other side and just entertain it, at least be willing uh, to entertain it. Um, I think it was Aristotle that says it's a mark of a, an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. Well, challenge them with that. Can you at least entertain? We're not asking you to accept it, but at least entertain this interpretation so that you can evaluate it, you know, be objective. Very few Calvinists, in my experience, have taken the time to really evaluate the best scholars from the other side. Most of them are listening to their echo chambers. They're listening to the MacArthur's and the Pipers and the Sproul's of the world who do not paint Armenians or non-Calvinist in a very accurate light whatsoever, as far as I've heard. Very few leading Calvinists have rightly taught their listeners what the other side actually teaches and believes. That's why I started this broadcast, because very little information is getting out there as to what the strongest, best scholars from the other perspective actually believe. And very few, at least the leading Calvinists, are willing to even engage with it. Um, They would rather straw man us than to actually engage with what we're saying. Point that out in love to your Calvinistic friends and help them maybe to see that maybe they've been misled by their their heroes of the faith. Um, Thank you, Evan, for your your kind words. Uh, Nathaniel, thank you for your super chat. Have you ever written or had a guest on to discuss? Oh, Eastern, uh, that was already on there. I read that earlier, Nathan, Nathaniel. But um, like I said, uh, if I can find somebody who could represent that well, then that might be a a good conversation. Hmm. I must be really behind here because these are 14 minutes ago. These are chats. (laughs) Let me fast forward. Y'all, y'all are so uh, talkative on the side chat over here. I'm missing a lot of good questions. Um, uh, Chris is asking, would you mind doing a video on the doctrine of God from a provisionist perspective? Um, I do have, I did do a video. I've, oh, man, I got, that would be a good one. Chris, that's a, that's, that would be a good, uh, that would be a good video. Um, I, I've confronted videos from Calvinists doctrine of God. Um, and in, do, in so doing, I presented a doctrine of God from a provisionist perspective, but doing a, a, doing a video solely upon the provisionist's p- 
perspective, so to speak, a provisionist doctrine of God and going through the attributes as we would see them. That wouldn't be bad. This book is is virtually that um, God's provision for all. It doesn't mention Calvinism in the bulk of the book. It's 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 a positive presentation of provisionism, and it does talk about the character of God at least, but just as a statement of faith, the doctrine of God. Um, I don't have a problem with the, the, the Baptist faith and message's doctrine of God statements. Uh, as far as I know, they're very biblical, and I would align with those uh, that are posted there on the website. But I, I don't know that I've done a video specifically on that. Um, okay, I'm just scrolling through here. Okay, Nathaniel does have a recommendation there, and I'll have to look it into that uh, when I get a chance. Um, well, Robin is saying the Calvary Chapel denomination teaches that we are unconditionally elect and able to respond. They call it compatibilism. Is that definition of compatibilism? Well, one, I wouldn't say that there, that Calvary Chapel has a monolithic uh, doctrine uh, or perspective on this. In fact, I just talked to a pastor from a, a Calvary Chapel church that's having me come and speak at a, a large pastor's conference uh, in uh, a few months um, on on this topic because he, he doesn't he agrees more with my perspective than the Calvinistic perspective. But uh, just like with Baptist, uh, C- Calvary Chapel has different views. Um, and, and my understanding is that the leadership back in the day has, has tried to strictly say Calvary Chapel should not be Calvinist because we don't hold to that view. Um, but... Uh, you know, you, you, you know, you you have the autonomy of the local church, the priesthood of every believer, even within Calvary Chapel churches. Some Calvary Chapel churches, in fact, are aligned with the Southern Baptist Convention, um, and so you've you've got a lot of various views depending upon the pastor at any particular uh, Calvary Chapel. Uh, and so you'd, I'd have to actually look at what that particular pastor at that particular Calvary Chapel church said in context to understand and, and be able to respond to it. But in general, Calvary chapels generally are, are not Calvinistic churches. They, they have spoke out against it um, much more vehemently and, and loudly than Southern Baptists, for example, have over the years. And so there's less, less Calvinists who go to Calvary chapel churches, typically in my experience. Um, all right. Again, just scrolling through questions here. Uh, Liberty Lama, thank you for your super chat. If Calvinists teach that God predestines reprobates to go to hell, how is is that that you never call them out for teaching a different God? Um, you can teach that someone is teaching something differently than God teaches without saying that they're teaching a different God. In, uh, in other words, um, you know, use eschatology, for example. Um, if I'm preaching post-trib and you're pre-trib, am I teaching that there's a different God? Because both of us are teaching that God's doing something differently. And so how God pulls about pulls off uh, the end times is maybe different interpretation from your two perspectives, but it doesn't mean it's a different God pulling off uh, the end times. And so how God pulls off salvation or what God does with salvation may be taught differently by two different people. And I may be saying that's not of God, that that teaching is not of God, which is exactly what I'm saying. Calvinism's teaching is not from the Bible. It's not a biblical teaching. And so it's not, it's not Christian t- doctrine as far as I can tell. I, I think it's sub-biblical. It's not from the scripture. But that doesn't mean that somebody can't have a genuine faith in Christ and believe in him. Uh, even though they hold to a, a, a non-biblical doctrine because of a misinterpretation. I don't believe, in other words, when I was a Calvinist, I lost my salvation for the 10 years that I adhere, I'd adhered to Calvinism. I don't think, oh, the Spirit, you know, I'm going to take away until he comes back. To, oh, now he's a provisionist again. Okay, I'll give him my spirit back again. I, I just don't, don't believe that that's the way it works. And so that, that's why I push back on that. So are there some Calvinists who aren't Christians? Well, sure. So there may be, there also may be provisionists who aren't Christians. Um, who are professing certain doctrines that aren't really redeemed. Um, and, and that can happen uh, in both worldviews. But I, I don't know the heart of anybody. And I think there, there are many Calvinists who are born-again believers who have wrongly interpreted because they were taught wrongly, they have wrong presuppositions, they understood the text wrongly, and they've come to the wrong conclusions. But it doesn't mean they, don't have, uh, they haven't been redeemed. So I've answered that a lot of times throughout the years. And people, there are still people on Twitter, just saw one today, in fact, who uh, typical typical kind of uh, kind of caged age kind of Calvinist 
on Twitter saying, you know, that I, I deny that Calvinists are saved and things like that. And I'm just like, and again, I saw some of you come to my defense and say, Leighton doesn't teach that, despite, <laughs> despite how many times I've said that I don't think that, you know, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter because people are secondhand going to just assume things about somebody without actually listening to them. And that is very unchristlike to, to uh, teach or say things about somebody you don't know anything about. Um, you see it way too often on social media, unfortunately. Um, all right, just scrolling through again. Want to give chance for all of you to get your questions in. I can't. Sorry, I can't see all of them and don't. Um, oh, I thought I already saw that. Okay, I'm going to go to the end here because I'm, I'm getting certain. Maybe some of you asked the same question more than once because I'm seeing some over here. Um, why are some churches, uh, thank you, Living Hope, for your super chat. Why are some churches not honest about being Calvinistic? Um, well, I don't, I don't know that all of them are intentionally being uh, disingenuous, like they're t intentionally trying to hide the fact that they're Calvinistic. Uh, some are trying to avoid labels for obvious reasons. Um, some don't want to put up barriers, just like the you know the reason some people take you know Baptist out of their name is because they don't they, they think some people have a negative you know con uh, uh, connotation with Baptists, and they don't want to associate with the Baptist tradition or whatever because people have a wrong or a negative uh, you know impression about it, and so they'll take the take the term out of out of the name. And some some people may do the same with Calvinists. They don't. They know that Calvinist is the, the term Calvinist has taken a beating, and so they don't want people to assume things that they don't necessarily adhere to or implications, and they don't want to make it a major issue. And so they will they will uh, you know keep it kind of hidden, so to speak, or not really you know, put it right out there. And and that's where sometimes you can lead to church splits. You you get to situations where the people are. Uh, you know, kind of duped to, to get involved in the church, so to speak, and they get, you know, plugged in and then they finally realize over time that it's Calvinist church and they're like, oh no. <laughs> so they, then they feel like they have to leave after all their investment and time in the church and it's really, it hurts them. And I, I get messages from people like that all the time. Like if they had just come right out and told me what they believed in the first place, I would have never joined this church. But now I've been there five years, I finally start picking up on this stuff and I've realized what they're teaching. And, and now I got to pull my family away from this place and it hurts. And uh, that, that happens all too often. The other thing that you'll see is there, you'll see a lot of people, um, you'll, you'll see a lot of people that will, uh, you know, you'll see churches that will get a new pastor who is Calvinist leaning, if nothing else, who doesn't come right out and say it in the interview process. And then slowly over time, he tries to reform the church, uh, kind of subtly begins to change their doctrines over the course of time. And I get at least one a month uh, in my inbox of a church that's splitting over that, that, that's happening a lot. Because most of, especially the Southern Baptist seminaries, uh, have almost exclusively, this is not true of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, by the way, but most of the other seminaries have almost exclusively Calvinistic theolo theology professors. And if you have a bunch of Calvinistic theology professors teaching a bunch of 20-somethings Calvinism, then you're going to have a lot more Calvinists being infused into these, uh, you know, more provisionistic type churches throughout the states. And church split recipe for church split is happening. And so you, you see more and more of that. And that's unfortunate. I have, there's, there's a article as well as a, a video called Stealth Calvinism, where I kind of go through that. I, I critique the reformed uh, the the reform group in Southern Baptist world called the Founders Conference, because the founders actually have in their statements and ways in which they teach that seem to be kind of subversive. Kind of seems to be like you slowly uh, reform the church and all these kinds of things, and it and it and it kind of it can cause uh, a lot of turmoil that we're seeing. Um, Do I need a copyright if I want to translate your videos or articles into other languages? Thank you very much. If you're giving credit to where credit's due as far as an article, because some of the articles aren't mine, and so uh, I can't give permission for you to use somebody else's you know, resources. But 
uh, you have my permission to translate anything that I say that's public and free, translate it and put it out there public and free because it's, I mean, if you learn that language and learn to speak English and read my article, it'd be free to you. So why wouldn't I want a Spanish speaker to be able to read it? And so if you want to take the time to translate it into something into Spanish and put it up for free, now if you go selling my stuff, um, that would be a problem because I, I wouldn't want you obviously selling stuff that doesn't, that's not yours uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I want it to be free. If I'm making it free, I would want it to be free to anybody else in another language. Um, th this has been translated into Spanish and will be published soon. Caleb has been working on that and I appreciate his efforts. So stay tuned. This will be out in uh, Spanish before too much longer. Uh, it's just it's just a process to get something like that done. It costs, costs money and time and energy and effort. By the way, those who are patrons who give on a regular basis, those who donate to make this possible, that is made possible by you. Um, translations and things like that. I, did, I haven't started a translation of this one yet. So if you'd like to give, make a, a donation to help us get the word out into other languages. Um, I've, I've had it requested in German. I've had it requested in Portuguese. I've had requests for um, uh, Japanese. I've had requests for all of these. I'm just like, oh, goodness. It's just, it's just, so, it's just cost. It costs money and time and energy and effort to, to do those things. And so that's one of the reasons that um, having having great people uh, stand with us on this uh, in this effort it makes a big difference. So go to the uh, About Us page uh, or the donation page, or there's a link in the show note and make a donation. You can make a one-time donation. Uh, if you want it specifically to go to translations, you can even put that in the notes uh, when you make a donation. Say, this is to be used for translation if you have a particular language. And I'll honor that. Um, I'll tell Caleb to watch for those, and I will use it only for translations uh, if if that helps. So your 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 donations will be appreciated if that if that. And we are five hundred one c three, so it would be tax deductible donation if you want to make those donations to help us do that. Um, Isaac, um, in my philosophy textbooks, the definition of predestination is the religious belief that God has decided from the beginning of time who will be saved and who will be damned. Is that right? No, no, it's not right. Um, in fact. Uh, Adam pointed that out. I might go back and listen to my discussion with Dr. Harwood. He actually quotes from several sources like that that wrongly interpret the word predestination to mean just that. And when you start with that system, systematic approach, that's why we talked about the order here, biblical first, historical, then systematic. When you start with a systematic, i.e. Calvinism, you get the interpretation like that one, and you read it back into the Bible. And that's why I went through all those verses to show you there's never a time where the word predestination is used to mean that God decided from the beginning who will and won't believe. Uh, that's just not what the word ever is entailed, uh, ever used uh, to teach. And so, good, good question. All right. By the way, those who complain, which some of you do, about the long videos, remember Caleb is producing on a weekly basis shorts where we'll have five or 10 minute clips from these longer videos. And so no complaining about the long videos. In fact, there are a lot of you theology geeks on the side chat who like the long videos. So uh, I am uh, providing for both. And at the same time, trying to... Okay, Abraham is asking a question here. Mr. Layton, what is the history of the SBC traditional soteriology since there were general free will Baptists, in particular Calvinist, I mean, independent Baptists, and share the same soteriology? Um, there is history on this. In fact, the founders' ministry that I mentioned earlier, their whole premise is we want to get the Southern Baptists back to their original roots soteriologically. And there's some, there's some truth in what they're saying, that most of the founders of the Southern Baptist Convention um, held to more Calvinistic theology. Uh, now, there's also things about original Southern Baptists that aren't so good. I mean, most Southern Baptists, obviously, during the time of the Civil War, slave owners. Um, and there's a lot of history there. And, and I'm not trying to equate Calvinists with slave owners, but... History does demonstrate and show to us that that the abolitionists typically were free will advocates and the Presbyterians and, and Calvinistic Baptists were typically more likely to own slaves during those days. That's just a fact of the matter. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to say Calvinists today would promote that by any means. Okay, I'm just saying that was a tendency of that day. And you could see why that might be because as a Calvinist, their caste system, so to speak, are created 
to be one of his elect or you're not, you know, and the, the, the kinds of groups of people that are created for certain things by God, that you were destined for that. It's what you were created for. And, um, and so they would use their theology oftentimes to promote that false belief. Um, again, going back to the question though, uh, when you go back to your original Southern Baptist roots, there was a Southern Baptist convention was a very small fledgling group of a few dozen churches kind of a situation and didn't become the largest Protestant denomination in the world until the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And under the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the soteriology was much more of a whosoever will provisionist kind of soteriology, that it became the behemoth, well-known Southern Baptist convention that we know of today. And so when we talk about the tradition of Southern Baptists, we're talking about the most predominant view held a hundred years ago or so. And just like you say, you know, I'm going to go to the, you know, the classic worship service or the traditional worship service. You're not saying I'm going to the worship services exactly the way the Southern Baptists started. You're saying I'm going to the worship service that was more like what my grandparents would have been used to with hymns or something like that, or with more classical music or with more traditional music. And so in the same way, when, when traditionalists, provisionists were referring to the tradition of the Southern Baptist, they weren't necessarily saying the 1860s and 70s Baptist. They were saying more like the 1950s Baptist, because in the 1950s, when the Southern Baptist was really booming, it was a more whosoever will kind of theology. And so that's, that can cause confusion for some people. And there are a lot of articles and, and things on that subject if you want to study a little bit more. Um, all right. Oh, a history episode would be good. Yeah, that might be, that, it might not be a bad, bad, a bad, um, thing to do is kind of walk through the whole history of it. Are you predetermined to believe in free will? <laughs> this debate is linguistically bizarre. Yeah, it, well, if, if Calvinism is true, then I was predestined to be a free will theologian. Um, I was also predestined to be a Calvinist for to affirm TULIP for 10 years, apparently, uh, which, again, is a problem I think Calvinists have to deal with. Uh, H, uh, JH, thank you for your super chat. John Piper, a call to be a mother is called to suffer. Encourage me as I struggle with cancer. How would you encourage me? Um, probably the same way that John Piper encouraged you. Um, Again, Calvinists oftentimes have the same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. And many of the articles and videos that I hear or read from MacArthur and Piper and the other leading Calvinistic pastors are virtually the same as I would say them. I don't always think they're all that consistent in the way that they say things. They seem to be inconsistent with their theology at times. But usually I agree with their counsel. I usually agree with how they uh, pastor people through suffering and hardships for the most part. Um, again, I take issue sometimes with the consistency of that, uh, given their, their beliefs uh, regarding determinism. But um, nevertheless, I don't know that my encouragement for you would be much different than, than their encouragement for you. Um, I don't believe God has to be the cause of or the author of or the one who brought about cancer in order to be the one who uh, helps you through it or uh, who encourages you. Um, or who redeems those situations for good or brings about good even through bad situations. In other words, I see God more as a redeemer of the evil and the suffering and the trials and hardships of this world. I don't think there is a, there's a need for him to be the cause of the evil in order to get uh, encouragement from whatever evil it is or whatever suffering that you may be going through. And by the way, uh, I'm very sorry for the struggle that you're going through. I've, I've had people close to me also uh, struggle with cancer. And, and I know that that can be a, a huge hardship. And so I'll be praying for you and appreciate uh, your question. Um, can it be both? Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what they're asking there. So I'm going to Have you a presentation on Romans 3? Yes, there is several presentations on Romans 3. What is the response? Oh, okay, it's specifically Romans 3, 23 through 25. 
Let's just look. I'm going to three. And we'll put it right up here on the screen. 23. Uh, the reason I, I put this on there because I have no idea what Romans 3.23, 3.25 says that would be controversial. <laughs> uh, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we all agree with that. Everyone's sinned. Um, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Sounds like provisionism to me. I know Calvinists would be fine with it too, but I'm not. If there's specifically um, Patmos Isle, uh, if there's a specific question about Romans 3.23 through 25, that, um, have, oh, he's asking, have you presented it to a Calvinist and got a response? What is the response? Um, yeah, they, they believe all this is true, that, that, but they believe that the reason you have faith, it's received by faith, that that's a gift from God. In other words, God gives certain people faith. And so it's received by faith, but ultimately God is the one who controls whether you have faith or not. And so I think that's, that's what their response would be. Sorry, I misread your your question to begin with. All right. Um, I'm trying to catch up with you people. So many questions so fast. Michael. Yeah, Michael's asking, are there other key parts to Harwood's commentary that are relevant to this topic and good for debating Calvinists? Yes. Um, in fact, the chapters on soteriology, there's a lot of good meat in there where he actually goes through each one of these verses too uh, in more detail that I, that I went through. He actually goes through them as well. Um, I, I think that chart there on 589 is worth the price of the book alone, but that's why I went over it. But there, yeah, but he goes over those verses himself. He quotes from both Calvinist and non-Calvinist like Herschel Hobbes. Um, See, so for example, he's quoting Hobbes here, and he says, God is chosen in the sphere of, by the way, Herschel Hobbes would have been kind of the the, the Southern Baptist uh, head leader of Southern Baptist back in the 1950s and 60s. Everybody knew who Herschel Hobbes was. He was kind of like uh, the, the representative of Southern Baptist, almost like Adrian Rogers was in his time. And Herschel Hobbes wrote a lot of uh, Sunday school curriculum and a ton of materials, a lot of stuff. And he's, he's quoted here, and he says, God has chosen in the sphere of Christ. He elected that all who are in Christ shall be saved. That's what, what I was just explaining. He's elected that all who are in Christ, by grace through faith, will be saved. In Christ is the boundary that God has marked out beforehand, like building a fence around a field, like the fortress uh, analogy that I gave earlier. And so he's using Herschel Hobbes as one of the, the scholars to um, to represent the more provisionist or the traditional Southern Baptist perspective, and so yeah, there's a lot of good meat in in that book that that you can you can get in having conversations with Calvinists. But there's also a ton of other materials, uh, including all kinds of, of issues that have nothing to do with sociology that many Calvinists would actually appreciate. He even he even gave a testimony of some Reformed people really appreciating his approach because he wasn't giving a uh, just an indoctrinated spill of non-Calvinistic sociology that he actually had quotes uh, giving perspectives, the best perspectives from the other scholars. And so I appreciate that about him as well. All right. Um, thank you for your super chat there. Ro 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Apologize. Um, Kenneth is asking, how, how do you understand the term open theist? That That's probably more than I can tackle right now because open theism is not a monolithic group. Um, some referring to their perspective as more of a dynamic omniscience um, and, and they have differing worldviews. This is one of the reasons that I don't throw those who wear the labeled dynamic or open theist out of the kingdom by just assuming that they're not Christians because they have a different philosophical explanation of how God works in time, because that's ultimately what it is. It's a philosophical uh, explanation of how God works as a, an infinite being with time, time bound creatures like us. And just because you have a philosophical, different philosophical conclusion than I have, I don't think that makes you unsaved. 
Uh, and so uh, I've gotten some flack on Twitter recently from James White and others who apparently seem to think that um, that the statement, I don't believe that open theist or dynamic omniscient uh, adherents, I don't believe that they should be cast out of the kingdom or cast out of your church equals, therefore I'm an open theist. Because some people don't have the, the ability to nuance things well enough to, to distinguish between those two. Um, just because I have friends who are open theists or dynamic perspective advocates, therefore I must believe that, or therefore I must be endorsing their view, or therefore I must, you know, no. The, many of the guys like Brian Wagner, uh, Warren McGrew, these guys that I've had on the program before who, who believe this also interpret some of the same texts that I interpret sociologically like I do. And therefore, I show agreement to them when it comes to those sociological issues that we're discussing with regard to Calvinism. But doesn't mean I can't disagree with them about other issues. And they know that. And they respect the fact that I have some disagreements with them. So? <laughs> and and, and some, well, you're so, you're so nice to those open theists, but to us Calvinists, you're so mean to... Really? What Calvinists have I been mean to? I've, I've, I have just as many, if not more, Calvinists on the program than I do open theists. And I treat them with the same level of respect, I think. I disagree with them just as much, uh, you know, I mean, I have more disagreement over the sociological issues of TULIP, obviously, with the Calvinist than I do with many of my dynamic omniscient friends, because they tend to agree with my interpretation of those particular texts. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, the, this, this, the, the theology police out there on Twitter who just want to throw everybody out of the kingdom who doesn't fit in their little tight bubbles and anybody who, who, who feels like we, our tent should be a little larger and that we should be a little bit more forgiving and gracious towards those who have differing eschatology and differing philosophical views of omniscience and differing... I mean, I, I don't want to throw Calvinists out of the Southern Baptist Convention. That should tell you something, people. I, I actually have a, I have a broadcast critiquing Calvinists, and I still don't want to throw them out of the convention. Why would I want to throw an open theist out of the convention? It just doesn't make any any sense to me. And then people will paint that as well. He's advocating for open theism, and he 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 thinks open theists are Christians too. Well, well yeah, I think they're Christians too. Just, it's just, you don't <laughs> you think they're you think their philosophical explanations of how time works disqualifies them from heaven? Grace just doesn't cover their philosophical difference with you. Grace is just not big enough to cover that thing. It can cover the murder of Uriah. Uh, and sleeping with his wife. It'll cover that, but it won't cover if you philosophically misunderstand how God works in time. It's just, it, it, it's absolutely the most ridiculous. Sorry, you got me on, you got me on my soapbox. It's just, uh, it's just asinine how people will, will believe that open theists aren't Christians because of their, again, just like any other group, there may be some open theists out there who are extreme and don't have Christian views at all and don't really believe in Christ and all these kinds of things may be out there that are advocating for certain views, just like there are determinists out there doing the same thing that aren't necessarily redeemed. But that certainly does not make people a, a unbeliever simply because they hold a different philosophical arguments with regard to how God works in time. It's just, it's really, really baffling to me how, how some people treat other other Christians who have different views than they do, um, especially when you actually read them, uh, uh, when you read them for themselves, when you when you actually listen to Warren McGrew explain why he comes to the conclusion he comes to, you're like, oh, okay, I can see what he's saying. You don't have the knee jerk reaction of, oh my gosh, he just he just th you know he just doesn't he thinks God's up there surprised and oh my gosh, I didn't know this. Is, and it's not what he believes. When you actually hear out his perspective. It, you know, you begin to understand where he's coming from and why he comes to those conclusions. And it sounds a lot like a Molinist. It sounds a lot like a, a determinist for that matter, as far as all the philosophical explanations, because that's what philosophers are going to do. They're going to philosophize about perspectives that the Bible doesn't necessarily give us a clear answer on. And it's, why you wouldn't show grace to people who do that, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, Wayne says, uh, thank you, by the by the way, Wayne. For your super chat, he says, "Keep up the good work, brother Layton. It's not easy standing against what majority now believe, and it, it does seem like a majority of people because of the way the internet has promoted Calvinism. It seems like a majority view. I still don't think it's a majority view. It, it, statistics show it's not the majority view. More of a thirty percent kind of perspective uh, from what the statistics have shown. Um, they, they sound like the majority view because the squeaky wheel gets the oil. They're they're a lot squeakier 
than the non-Calvinists out there. Calvinists are squeakier, much more so. Um, uh, Rill K is asking, what is God's sovereignty according to Scripture? It, sovereignty means king, kingship or rule, ruler. He is the authority overall. Um, what's the right view? There actually is an article um, uh, at Sociology 101 called Saving Sovereignty. And I, believe it or not, I quote from a Reformed scholar because I agree with a Reformed scholar on how uh, he, the misuse of the word sovereignty as meaning determinism is just not a proper use of the word. And so I would, I would refer, refer you to that article, uh, if you don't mind, just to save my voice here as I'm uh, closing this down. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people asking about certain verses, and I'm not sure I have time as we close this to go through each one of those, so I may have to defer to other things. And Nathaniel, thank you again for your super chat. What percentage of non-denominational churches in North America do you estimate are Calvinist in teaching? Uh, I, I would be guessing if I did, but um, statistically, if if Southern Bab the Southern Baptist world reflects kind of all because a lot of non-denominational churches are very Southern Baptisty, <laughs> so to speak. They're very similar to the Southern Baptist uh, theological perspectives for the most part, at least just like the Calvary Chapel churches are very, very similar to the the doctrines of the Southern Baptist churches. Um, and if if the statistics carry over, which I would assume they probably do, pretty pretty fairly, that it would be about twenty to thirty percent lean Calvinistically. Whereas the rest would be not not Calvinistic, if, if the statistics hold. And that number may be rising among Calvinists because of of the internet and the uh, prolific writing and teaching of Calvinists out there. There's a lot more of us, a uh, lot more Calvinists out there teaching than non-Calvinist. Yeah, <laughs> some of which. Some of the things y'all put on here, I can't, I can't even put on there. Not appropriate, but sometimes funny. Um, all right. This is a question I get a lot. Um, Real, Real K is asking again. Um, I can't find a biblically grounded church near me that isn't Calvinistic. Any recommendations for the East Valley, Arizona? It's a greater a greater evil f me focused on sermons on Calvinism. Um, I get this question weekly, uh, two or three times a week probably, or comments underneath a video. Hey, can you help me find a church that's not Calvinist? There's no way for me to know that. I just, there's no, I don't, we don't have a database of provisionistic churches. If somebody would like to take on that project and start a website or a, a, I'll link to it if you want to start a website. Founders did this. Uh, the Founders Ministry did this with a kind of started finding all the churches that align, aligned with Calvinism and they started putting pins on a map, so to speak, online so that you could find the Calvinist church in your area. If one of you wants to take on that project, go for it. Uh, be my guest. My, my time is too limited right now to pull something like that together. But if somebody wants to try to take on that perspective, then be my guest. Um, uh, it would be a lot of work, I think. And uh, it would maybe a worthwhile work. All right. Excuse me while I drink in your ear. This bottle of water. But I told you I would answer questions, and so I'm trying to honor that for the first time in a while. Sorry, sorry not to get all your questions in, but based upon the amount of investment of time it would take to answer some of them, some of them I just cannot. Yes, I know that when I say Baptist, it sounds like I'm saying Bab, Baptists, Bab. I don't know if that's just my Texas drawl. I don't, Bab, I, I sounds like I'm saying Baptist, Bab, Bab, p, 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 the B, P. I'm, buh. I'm not saying Baptists. Bab, 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 bab,
what I love about doing online video stuff is um, you, you find out all the words that you've mispronou- been mispronouncing for many years. You find them all out <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> and, so, there, and there's a lot of, I remember, remember reprobation uh, that I was leaving out the second R, reprobation, reprobate, repo- reprobate, reprobate, that I would say for you. I didn't realize I was even doing it until somebody pointed it out to me. Uh, what was another one? Uh, there's been several. You you people who've listened for years know ca- casual. I was saying casual instead of casual for a while there. I don't know why. I, th- I was thinking casual in my brain. I was writing casual, but I would say casual determination <laughs> or casual. No, it wasn't casual. What was I say? I, I used the word casual in several videos, and I'd go back. Or um, coniferous instead of carnivorous lion. Coniferous, like the trees, a coniferous tree. Some of these like, oh, I go, oh man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Didn't realize I was saying it. I hear it in my brain, right? Yeah, but when I listen back on the video, I go, oh my gosh, I said that totally wrong. How did I say that? And I know there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, sixty thousand subscribers. Yes, we just got to sixty thousand. Congratulations, it says. Um, and a, 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 a last five thousand of that probably was Mike Winger, um, just recently uh, promoted one of my videos because I did a response for him to another person who was critiquing him and he put it out on his page and a good three or 4,000 at least subscribers came within the next week or two. Uh, So thanks Mike Winger for that. Um, If y'all don't follow Mike Winger, you should. He's a provisionist, if you will. I don't know if he's used that term before, but he is, he believes like we do sociologically. And so, uh, and a great teacher on a variety of other topics. A lot of you are like, oh, why don't you teach on this topic? Why don't you teach on that topic? I, I often will refer them to Mike because uh, he, he has an online ministry that does that. I, I have a full-time job and four kids and have a ton of other work. This is something I just do on the side, five, maybe 10 hours a week at most that I spend on preparing and, and putting these out. Uh, this is just a side thing that I do. Uh, if any of you would like to uh, start a foundation that starts a you know provisionistic uh, publishing company and all those kinds of things and you want me to start full time on that and you have some big oil donor that would like to make that happen then I will pray about it but right now I love what I'm doing with Texas Baptist and I plan on doing that until I retire and so I, I love being the director of evangelism it's, it's one of the things I love doing um, penal substitution I do not have a resource on that but um, I, I have some video on atonement and differing views on atonement, but I don't know that I have anything on specifically on uh, the differing views. I, I've talked to William Lane Craig about that. I know he's done some videos on the penal substitutionary atonement um, and his perspective, and I tend to agree with his arguments on that point, but he also makes a point, I think that's valid, that all the differing views have some element of truth depending on what passage you're looking at with regard to atonement, but that might be a good show as well. I, I'll look into that. Um, Thank you, I quick for your super chat. Do you think of the fact that there's an uneven distribution of Christians in the world sheds a doubt on unconditional election based upon nothing foreseen? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh, it seems kind of strange that God would only elect or elect a large majority of people from a certain region versus another. Uh, that explanation seems very easy for free will advocates because If you have free will and you have more light, more revelation in a particular area, you're going to have more converts. Uh, Whereas on a Calvinistic perspective, you have to have ultimately God, for whatever reason, choosing more of this nationality than another, uh, which doesn't seem to be uh, supporting an unconditional portion of a view of election, for sure. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, C.L. White says, to me, simply comes down to God determining for mankind to freely respond to his gospel. That's exactly right. It, God can determine things, and he can determine for us to have a free choice in the matter, and that's what we believe he does. And sometimes I'll just ask Calvinists, do you believe God could determine for us to have our own determination? Do you believe he has the capacity of creating people who make their own determinations? And I, I can't imagine a Calvinist being able to say, no, God doesn't have that power or that ability. And so once you get into that point, then it's just a matter of whether the scripture supports that perspective or not. Um, once you admit it's possible. All right. That's foreknowledge. 
Irresistible truth. Oh, that's Derek. Hey, Derek. Thanks for the super chat. Highlight and question. If God tried harder, could he have saved more people he loves? Um, it depends on what you mean by tried harder. Uh, I don't think God could be more clear in his revelation. Uh, I think God's made his, his revelation himself clear, uh, sufficiently clear. Um, and so uh, remember, we don't believe in effectual salvation. We believe that God provides the means of salvation for all people. And so it's not like he's trying to save people and failing. And sometimes people like yourself kind of project your theology onto our view as if we believe that God's trying to save people and failing. We don't believe that. We believe that God's revealing himself and allowing for anyone to be saved. And therefore, uh, he's not failing when somebody's not saved because he's not failing to make himself known. He has made himself known sufficiently, according to Romans 1. And if they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, that's their fault, not his. It's not a lack of revelation like it would be on your view. It'd be a lack of grace on your view. That's the reason they don't believe is because of a lack of grace, a lack of provision, a lack of revelation. But we're saying, no, no. They, According to Romans 1, they have what they need to believe. They suppress the truth. They trade the truth of God in for lies. That trading presumes that they have it. You don't have something to trade unless you have it. You have to have it to trade it. And so they have truth, they have light, they trade it for lies. That's their choice. They're not innately uh, bound or determined to do that. They could have accepted the truth so as to be saved. And if they trade the truth in for lies and suppress the truth, that's their fault, not God's, not a lack of provision, or God's failing, or God's uh, trying, but he just can't do it, that kind of stuff that oftentimes Calvinists project onto us. Um. A list of colleges. Well, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, where I teach, would be one that I would obviously recommend. New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, where I graduated from, did my PhD under Adam Harwood, I would highly recommend. Um, I went to Southwestern too. I can't say that I would recommend it as far as this issue is concerned because they tend to lean more Calvinistically now uh, due to uh, recent changes in, in out Southwestern that I, I you know, uh, I think they lean more Calvinistically Calvinistically now than they did before. And so if you're trying to avoid that, then uh, Southwestern would be my first choice. Southern is definitely Calvinistic, uh, not just predominantly Calvinistic, almost exclusively, uh, if not exclusively Calvinistic. And so I would not recommend Southern if you're trying to avoid uh, being only taught Calvinism in, in the classroom. But if you're looking for a good online education, I recommend Trinity, trinitysim.edu, if you're looking. And there's also a link in the show notes. I'm trying to read while I'm talking, and that's hard to do sometimes. Derek, thank you. Derek's another uh, great commenter and always has really good questions and answers on side chat. I appreciate that. Um, just want to convey my appreciation. Addressing Calvinism tends to bring a mob with it. And you do it daily. I'm exhausted after taking one just yesterday. Yeah, I don't do it daily. Uh, it may seem like that because uh, stuff's being put out there daily. But that's thanks to Caleb and Eric and um, several others that help to uh, keep the keep the feeds alive, so to speak. Um, like I said, maybe once a week, twice a week, I'll get on and do something. But otherwise, I'll wear myself out with this just as much as you would. Because, yes, it, it can get overwhelming sometimes. By the way, that means sometimes when you're seeing Twitter stuff and Facebook posts and stuff like that, sometimes it's not me, but sometimes it's a repost of something I've said. So I'm supporting, obviously, what it's saying. But sometimes that's that's not necessarily me doing all that. That's that's um, our team helping helping with that process and volunteers helping with that process too. So uh, I'm not. That's not all just me. Um, Uh, I hate to miss some of these questions. Some of these, some of these questions I'm marking for a future episodes because they're really good, but they would take me too long to kind of unpack all right now, or I would need to get some resources uh, for stuff. Hmm. All right, I'm scrolling through it. Oh, I caught up with y'all. Believe it or not, I got to the end of the list here even though I missed a lot of y'all's questions. But again, it doesn't mean I'm ignoring you. I just may not have seen all of them. I had to scroll through pretty fast. Does Calvinism qu quench the spirit? Um, 
any false teaching can quench the spirit in the sense of teaching teaching you something that's not true can can lead you to false beliefs or false understanding and thus false behavior bad behavior and so it can do that it doesn't necessarily mean it will um, all right um, I came across Eddie saying I came across you about a month ago bought your tip telling through the tulip uh, 20 years is a five point changing my mind thank you um, that, Eddie thank you for posting that um, his, his, I, I love when Calvinists who are coming out of Calvinism post and, and tweet to me and let me know because that does encourage me a lot of them don't let me share their name because they're still in a reformed church and they're still trying to work through this stuff but on a weekly basis I get messages like this of people who are coming out of Calvinism and the reason I like to post those and put them up there is because um there are a lot of you think oh, this just never works. Nobody ever changes their mind. Everybody's always just stuck in the way that they're going to see it. And never, gonna, that's just not true. Um, there are a lot of, of people who are, are leaving Calvinism behind once they really study uh, the other perspective. Um, and so uh, we're, our, our work is not, uh, is not in vain. There are a lot of people who are, are beginning to see the other side and begin to study the best perspectives from the other view. Um, and so I, 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 I just want to point that out that, you know, it, it does make a difference. Um, I am going to bring this to a close. Uh, appreciate that, Dean. Appreciate your, your kind words. Um, have Chris Dayton and I have talked since our last video. Uh, I love Chris too. Um, no, he and I haven't, haven't done anything since I, I don't think since our last video. Um, occasionally we'll text each other or message each other about different things, but nothing, nothing of, of recent. Uh, I did listen to uh, Tim Stratton and Chris Date uh, recently on their discussion on, uh, on determinism. And I, I do uh, recommend that because I think that Tim Stratton does a really good job uh, kind of exposing some of the issues of determinism. And, uh, and uh, I enjoyed the discussion because I'm a theology geek that likes to hear that kind of stuff. And those guys are, are good thinkers, much more so than I'll ever hope to be. And so it's good to hear at least philosophical minds that are greater than mine talk about stuff that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. So if you haven't listened to that back and forth with Chris Date and uh, Tim Stratton, both of them are professors at Trinity, by the way, uh, proving that we are not a monolithic group. We have various views on our staff. If you'd like to get a real education, consider that. Uh, Jamie, thank you for your super sticker. Appreciate that. Um, and the nice comments. There are a lot of good, nice complimentary things being said. Appreciate your work. Thank you for that as well. And as always, as you leave this place, remember what we always say, share Christ and show love. God bless.